This is the fourth part of our 454 rebuild series, and this time we'll be working on the engine block. We'll clean up our gasket services, do some finish honing on the cylinders, pull all the plugs, then clean this thing up. Okay, we're gonna start cleaning this up by scraping off as much of the head gasket surface as we can. First up, we're just using a plain old razor blade scraping tool. The majority of what was on the deck surface was cleaning up easily, but it was still going to be a long process. And it was going to make a mess. I'm going to try to cover up some of the stuff towards the center of the engine just to give it the best odds at not filling up with debris. And after optimistically placing that shop towel, we'll get back to scraping. Be cautious of a lot of the edges like around the coolant ports because they're fairly sharp and they will try to catch the blade. And be very careful not to nick anything around the cylinders. Thanks to modern head gasket designs, there's some forgiveness around most of these ports, but the cylinder seal is not where you want to mess around. Keeping the blade clean and not being afraid to change it out halfway through a job will make this much easier. The process we're using here is exactly the same as what we did for the Blazer engine in that build series. We'll use the razor blade to get off as much gasket material, gunk, and rust as possible, but it's not the final stage of cleaning, so we don't have to get 100% of everything. Okay, we finished cleaning up the majority of the deck surfaces with the scraper. We're gonna go ahead and switch over to the air die grinder. This is a tiny bit controversial. People got a little bit upset the last time I used this when we were rebuilding the engine for the Blazer, but I'm gonna stand my ground on this one and say a wire wheel is pretty much the best way to clean a head gasket surface on an iron block. With just the light pressure we'll be applying, there's not really anything we could do with this relatively soft bristle brush to scratch it. Some of the wheels with thicker wires would probably not be the best thing to use, but if they have these really fine stringy wires like this particular wheel, this is a Harbor Freight wheel. These are really cheap and they do shed probably faster than some of the other ones, but they work really well. As long as you wear a, a face mask or something, you should be totally fine using this. They also last longer than something like a Rolock wheel and they're not gonna fill the engine full of abrasives that could potentially be a serious issue. If the whole thing's apart and you're gonna be cleaning it anyway, it's not a huge deal. But these, at least you could just pick them up with a magnet if they came off in the engine somewhere. You can just kind of pick them up as you go. Anyway, let's turn on the air compressor and start cleaning. We got to use that for about 60 seconds before the air compressor decided it wanted to be a drama queen and trip breakers. So we'll use the backup rotary tool, which is this much abused DeWalt drill. It's not as fast as the die grinder and it's a bit more unwieldy, but it will also get the job done. I'm not applying a huge amount of downward pressure to do the cleaning, we're mostly just trying to set the brush on the surface. And doing this, it took about 15 minutes to get this side of the block to shine. Then we joyously get to repeat the process on the other side. Soon enough though, the deck surface was looking pretty nice. Okay, that took a lot longer than I had planned since I had to use the power drill because the air compressor is acting up again, but got it done. And the deck surfaces, as well as the rails, are clean. We clearly, you know, have to wash the whole thing, but the um, surface is totally smooth. And next up is the timing cover. This is looking pretty grody. We're gonna clean up the timing cover and water pump gasket surfaces. We'll use the same process we just showed to clean up the front surface of the block. Some of these aren't sealing surfaces, so it's not entirely necessary to clean them, but we're going to be painting this later and it would be a lot nicer if all of the flat surfaces were as clean as possible. So we'll be scraping pretty much every external surface that's been machined flat. The next one of those we need to get to is at the bottom of the block, so we'll spin it around we'll be scraping the entire lower surface of the block clean as well. Before we get started, there are just a few obstacles to clear out. First is this bolt, which is holding what's left of a transmission cooler line clamp. And with that removed, we're clear to scrape up the RTV from the oil pan seal. Luckily, it comes loose without a fight, and we'll continue scraping the rest of the surface we can get to. In an attempt to keep as much of this as possible out of the oiling system, we'll leave that oil filter angle adapter on for now, 
while we scrape and polish the surface around it. Again, since we're going to be cleaning it all out anyway, it probably doesn't matter, but I figured I may as well. To clean the last little bit though, we will have to remove it. It turned out to be a little trickier than expected because its bolts are protected by square drive plugs. And of course, they're not a common drive size like a quarter inch or a three eighths. Turns out they're a five sixteenths and I didn't have a tool for that. So let's try to make something that'll work. On the left is a 5 16 inch bolt, but of course we'll need something a little bit bigger to make a square out of it. So we'll grind down this 3 8 inch bolt to make our tool. Using the metal backed part of the belt sander, we'll grind it into a square. We'll keep dunking the bolt in water as we go to try to keep it from getting too hot. And we'll keep checking the size with a pair of digital calipers until we get it just right. After a few minutes of that, we had this to work with. Admittedly, the bolt we started with was a little on the small side, but it was able to do the trick. Those plugs didn't seem to be all that tight, so luckily the bolt was able to pull them out with no issues. And with those out of the way, we can see the two Torx bolts that are actually holding in the adapter. We'll switch over to a T40 bit, and that quickly takes care of those bolts. Once the adapter has been lifted out of the way, we can also remove the O-ring seal. And that's as far as we'll take that apart. Generation 5 and 6 454s have two bypass valves built in, one for the oil filter and one for the oil cooler. Those are peened into place and they're not something we're going to be removing. For now, we have to finish cleaning the lower surface of the block. That means more quality time with the wire wheel on the drill. Once the oil pan gasket surface is sparkling, we'll move back to the front of the engine and wire wheel the timing cover area. A few more minutes of that and we are pretty much set here. The last couple things to do, I'm going to clean up the cylinders, run the hun through to give them a better crosshatch pattern. Then we'll pull out all the plugs, knock out the core plugs and wash it. We spent plenty of time in a previous video talking about honing out these cylinders so we won't cover all of that again. The process is basically the same as the last time, but this time we have a different goal. Previously, I just wanted to get the rust out of the cylinders and see exactly how bad they looked. But this time, the aim is to leave a nice surface on the insides of the cylinders for the piston rings to seat against. Like just about anything, there are different ideas out there on the best way to do this, but we're going to use this three stone hone to attempt a 45 degree crosshatch pattern. That's what you'll see most commonly as a desired cylinder wall finish. To do this, we have to sync up the plunge speed with the drill speed. This variable speed drill that wants to spin the hone a lot faster than I'd like it to does not make this the easiest. So I decided to just go for a RPM that seemed fairly repeatable with a decent plunge speed. Again, a fixed speed slower drill and slower plunge speed would be better, but this looks like it was doing okay. We're once again going through all eight cylinders to do this, but since we're just lightly resurfacing them, it took much less time than the previous honing. The technique I ended up using was to keep the cylinders heavily oiled and watch the patterns in the oil film while spinning the hone. This was a bit tricky to pick up on camera and was a lot more obvious when looking at it in person, but it was very easy to follow the path of the hone looking at this oil film. And once the plunge and drill speed came together just right, the lines in the oil film were meeting at a nice 45 degree angle. And after finishing the rest of the cylinders with this process, this is what the result looked like. You can definitely still see the marks from the previous aggressive honing, but there's also a clear 45 degree pattern of crosshatching from what we just did. It's not the most picturesque, but I think it'll be plenty to keep our cast iron piston rings sealed. Or at least as well as is possible because cylinder number three still has some fairly bad markings on it. As mentioned previously, they feel totally flat, and I think that's going to be good enough for me. At least, we'll be able to find out exactly how detrimental staining like this actually is. Other than some more cleaning, this is the last thing we'll be doing to the cylinder walls, so this is what they will look like as we assemble the engine. And we'll move on from that, because there is plenty left to do. Next up, we'll be removing all of the plugs that are in the engine. 
This is the set of new plugs that we got, and it can help to lay these out and make sure you got all of the old ones. In my experience, these sets usually aren't an exact match for every engine, but they'll get you fairly close. We'll be using most of the plugs in this kit, since a lot of the original GM ones are kind of annoying. For example, these square head oil gallery plugs. I have a few square style sockets, but of course none of them fit on these. So we'll just loosen them using a good old fashioned adjustable wrench. Luckily, these three plugs inside of the lifter valley came loose without a fight. And now that those have been removed, we'll go to the front of the block. There are three hex plugs capping off the oil galleries for the cam and lifters, but these three factory plugs are a little bit special. If you look closely, you can see there is a small hole drilled through each one. Something I had previously heard was that this was to help oil the timing chain, and since it used a plastic gear, I figured it needed all the oil it could get. But more recently, I also heard that these are used to help drain oil out of those galleries during startup to keep the lifters quieter. For now, let's just focus on getting them out. But they seem like they're in there pretty tight. What a normal person would do after the small socket and small impact failed would be to use a larger socket and a breaker bar. But me? I've got a bigger impact and adapters, no problem. And to make matters even worse, I actually dinged the very outside edge of that front cam bearing. Those poor, poor things. Before reinstalling the cam, we'll take a razor blade and clean up that little ding on the edge. And we still haven't gotten out any of those plugs, so we better get back to it. Ah yes, that's much more like it. And with those finally out, we'll move to the rear of the block. The rear gallery plugs obviously aren't drilled like the front were, and these are square drive. Luckily, these are quarter inch drive, and we already have a standard adapter for that. So let me do the exact same thing I did two minutes ago, and stack some adapters together to get the big impact on there. Well that tiny little impact adapter is definitely tougher than the hex bit, but it still failed. To hopefully keep me from breaking all of my tools, we'll grab the map gas torch and start heating up around these plugs. After hitting it for around 30 seconds, we'll put on a fresh adapter and use a breaker bar to turn it. It took a fair amount of force, but I'm sure a lot less than it would have taken without the heat. And now that it's loose, we'll use a smaller impact gun to walk it the rest of the way out. Then we'll set our sights and the torch on the other two gallery plugs. This time going straight to that small impact because of... Confidence? Luckily that worked just fine, and no more twisted adapters. With those out, we can peek down the galleys, and fortunately they look totally clean. Starting with a well-maintained, not sludged up engine like this one will make cleaning everything so much easier. Getting back to disassembly, we'll pop out this plug covering the oil pressure port at the rear of the block, and go straight to the torch to loosen up these plugs at the rear. These are 5 16 square plugs, so luckily we have already made a tool for them. But because nothing is ever easy, these plugs are extremely tight, and that bolt that we shaved down to remove the oil filter plugs is not going to work here. It's just a little bit too small, and if we keep trying to force it, we're just going to round out these plugs. So let's go back and make a better one. This time we're starting with a 7 16 inch bolt instead of a 3 8 We're also starting with a longer bolt and cutting off the threaded sections so that we have even more material to start with. Then, just like before, it's off to the sander. It took around 10 minutes of sanding, but we were getting pretty close. This time, instead of measuring, I was just checking the fit against one of the plugs that we already removed from that oil filter adapter. And once it was a nice, snug fit, our tool was ready to go. And here is our version 2 square drive to hex adapter. I was feeling pretty confident about this one, but those plugs were still really tight, so we will break out the torch once again before we try to loosen them. Then we'll install our tool, and it was definitely a tight fit, it required a little bit of pressing to get it all the way installed, and apply some force to it, and more force, and a bit more force, and finally it came loose. We'll unthread that the rest of the way, congratulate our tool on its victory, 
and then celebrate by hammering it into the other plug. I was feeling confident, so this one got the impact treatment, and that did the trick. And we get to do that one more time for the plug right above the oil filter boss. Moving to the side of the engine, we have the plug for the coolant passage, and up front we have this nasty looking oil pressure switch. You could use a regular wrench or channel locks to remove this, but I actually happen to have a GM oil pressure socket from previous exploits, so we'll use that to take it off. Now we'll move to the other side of the engine block where we have the knock sensor and the other lower coolant plug. That's the last of the threaded in plugs and now we have to knock out the pressed in ones. To punch these core plugs out of their bores, all we're going to use is a pry bar and a hammer. We'll walk it around the outside of the core plug to get it moving and then give it a few hard taps to knock it fully out of its bore. Normally, this is where you'd pry the plugs out of the block, but with this Gen 5, the coolant ports are so large, the plugs can actually fit through them. So, once the plug has been knocked loose, all you should have to do is give it a little push, and it should fall free of the block. Once we've removed the third and final driver side plug, we'll repeat this process on the other side of the block. And with those six plugs out of the way, there is only one left. That would be the large plug at the rear of the cam tunnel. To knock this one out while protecting our installed camshaft bearings, I decided to wrap this long extension with masking tape. A piece of corrugated split loom or rubber tubing or anything similar to that would do the job just as well. And once that long 3 8 inch extension has been mummified, we can slide it into the engine block. Then all we have to do is hold it up against that core plug from inside the block and give it a few taps from the other side. It started moving right away and didn't take a huge amount of force to free it. That's the last plug to remove and the engine block is finally bare. Here we have our lineup of the old plugs against the new ones included in that kit. One of the reasons that those old core plugs came out so easily is that the factory ones were brass. The only exception is the cam tunnel plug, which is a steel part in both the factory and aftermarket kits. It sure would be nice if we could just throw in those shiny new parts, but of course there is a lot of cleaning ahead of us. And we'll get started with this pressure washer, which we'll be using to spray down the engine block. For a degreaser, we're going to be trying out purple power. And we'll start this bath off using that degreaser and the soap nozzle on the pressure washer. We'll try to get some of that degreaser on all of the interior and exterior surfaces. For the most part, I've been really impressed with how clean this engine already was. There is some rust and scale buildup in the coolant passages, but it's a pretty typical amount. I'm trying to spray up into the corners of all of these passages until the sudsy water coming out is clean. And we'll do the same thing for the oil passages, trying to get that degreaser everywhere. Then we'll flip the block over and hit everything again. Once it seems like we're only seeing clear water coming out, it's time to start rinsing. We'll start with a turbo nozzle on this wand, which will help us get good coverage out of a high pressure stream. In the video, it kind of just looks like a mist, but if we slow things down a bit, you can see that it is spinning a high pressure stream around and around. So while it's covering a larger area, you also need to be aware that you're hitting parts with a whole lot of pressure. This pressure washer pump is putting out somewhere around 2500 psi, which won't damage the iron block, but I did leave those cam bearings installed. And while a direct application like this is a great way to clean out those oil passages, it turned out that this pressure was a bit much for the cam bearings. I did the same thing when we left the cam bearings installed on that Chevy 350 that we rebuilt for the Blazer, but that was an older pump on the pressure washer, and it was putting out at least a few hundred psi less. Whatever it was that made the difference, the pressure in those oil passages was just enough to push out the inner edge of this seam on the rear cam bearing. I didn't actually notice this until later, but it's pretty safe to say that this is where the damage occurred. It's a small part of the surface area and only on the inner layer of the bearing, not the actual steel outer layer. So this is going to be yet another, fingers crossed, I hope this is okay kind of situation. In hindsight, I do regret, at least a little bit, not replacing the bearing once I noticed the damage, but it's going to stay in there, so we'll just have to see what happens. 
Because of this, I would stay a bit farther away than I am in some of these clips, or at least stick to an angle nozzle. The pressure washer is a great way to clean off an engine block, but clearly some care needs to be taken. Once everything has been thoroughly rinsed off, we'll get out some WD-40 and pipe brushes. A spray bottle full of degreaser would probably be a better choice here, but the WD-40 is what I had on hand. We'll go through and wipe down all of the lifter bores with this plastic bristle brush. Now, or before now, would also be the time to clean off all of the internal threads. Particularly on the threads for the cylinder head bolts since they go through into the water jacket and we'll be putting sealer on them. The vast, vast majority of the engine was pretty darn clean at this point, but there were a few minor deposits left to clean up. Mainly, a few small bits of stuck on grime on the outside of the engine and at the top of the lifter valley. Some close up directed spraying took care of that quickly. Since we blasted that loose and brushed out the lifter bores, we'll rinse everything off one more time. And finally, we have an engine block that is pretty darn clean. Of course, with the hot tank or the right machinery, it is possible to get an engine cleaner than this, but for an at-home job and a low-budget rebuild, this is perfectly adequate. The problem now is that we washed all of the oil off of these iron surfaces and covered them in water, so they are starting to flash rust. There's a large amount of surface area and a lot of little nooks and crannies that need to be dried off, so we'll use the blowgun hooked to the air compressor to speed up the process. You'll go over each surface and pay special attention to every single threaded hole. And once an area is as dry as we can get it, we'll spray it down with WD-40. I know I kinda tend to use it for everything, but for once we're actually using this product for its intended purpose. It will help to displace the water, as well as provide a thin film of oil to keep rust from starting. You'll go over the entire engine block several times drying things in this manner. Every bolt hole, every port, every cylinder totally dried off, then protected. Once all of the water is finally gone, we'll go over all of the machined surfaces we can get to with a paper towel and more WD-40. This serves as not only rust prevention, but a final pass of cleaning. After this, I left it for a few hours to dry, and then coated the whole thing in plastic wrap. I knew it would be a while before reassembly, so this will help keep the block totally clean until then.